So our topic for this video is thermodynamics. And this will be several videos in this series, but to start with, we want to get some basics taken care of. So we're going to take a look at the nature of energy. Your learning objectives for this video are listed here. Remember to pause the video and write them down and come back when you're ready. So to start with, we want to define some terms. We'll start by defining the term energy. Energy is the capacity to do work or produce heat. So, so sort of a general definition, textbook definition, of course, but this really gets at what we're doing with energy. We're doing something with it. We're either going to do some work, and we don't really get into the concept of work too much in this class, but work in chemistry means we're going to be pushing something by, by making gases expand, and that's really all you need to know about it. Uh, but more importantly, the other thing we can do with energy is we can produce heat, and that's the subject of thermodynamics. You might want to remember back to the very beginning of the year when we talked about the law of conservation of energy. Energy can be neither created nor destroyed. It can only be converted from one form into another. And that speaks to something called the first law of thermodynamics, which we'll see in just one second. There are several types of energy that we need to be aware of. Uh, the two that we're going to be most familiar with in this section are potential energy, which is represented by PE, and that is energy that's not being used, it's energy that's stored up, and it's due to position or composition. So where the object is, if it's very high off the ground, for example, it would have a lot of potential energy, uh, or its composition, what it's made of, what its bonds are like. So attractive or repulsive forces, things like the intermolecular forces that we've talked about, uh, can contribute to potential energy as well. The other type of energy is called kinetic energy, and that's due to the motion of the object or particles of the object. And we already know a little bit about kinetic energy from previous discussions. If you take a look at this little picture where our bicyclist is riding up over a hill, uh, we can get a sense of what we mean by potential energy versus kinetic energy. So on the left side of this hill, we have our bicyclist putting in some energy to get up to the top of the hill. So he's changing kinetic energy, the energy of his motion, into potential energy, the energy of his position up high. When he gets to the top of the hill, he's, if he stops there for a second and he's not moving, he has very low kinetic energy, but he's got a great deal of potential energy. He's very high off the ground, and if he allows gravity to take over on the way down, then he can convert all of that potential energy into kinetic energy and be moving fairly quickly. On the left side, he's putting the energy in, he's doing the work, but on the right side, the energy is coming out automatically. Gravity's doing the work. And that's sort of what we look like uh, when we look at processes that involve energy. Now, in the case of thermodynamics, we're going to be interested in figuring out uh, how much energy is involved, and it's very difficult to measure the energy of something. Uh, the potential energy of something. So in order to measure the potential energy of something, we need to, to let that energy move from one place to another. We can't really measure the energy until it's doing something or until it's moving, it's being transferred. So we'll look at transferring energy. One of the things we want to make sure we remember is that temperature is a measurement of kinetic energy. It's not a measurement of heat. So when you measure the temperature of something, what you're really measuring is the average kinetic energy of the particles of that substance. If we want to transfer energy, then we're going to be interested in how the particles are going to be moving. You see, what happens is when heat contacts matter, it changes into kinetic energy. That's why we often talk about measuring heat or uh, how hot something is by taking its temperature. What we're really measuring is how much kinetic energy that those particles have after being exposed to some heat. So heat causes particles to move faster, greater kinetic energy, greater temperature. You want to transfer energy, you can transfer energy by heat. If there's a temperature difference, energy will be moved. Or you can do work. And like I said, we're not going to really talk about work in this section, but just understand that that could be part of a, a way to transfer energy between, between objects or between systems. We're going to be interested in heat. Some terms. The system. So the system that you are observing is the part of the universe on which your focus lies. The system is something that you just decide. You choose it. 
You define the system. Once you've defined your system, the surroundings become apparent. The surroundings are defined by your system. Usually, the system is, in chemistry, what's inside your container. That's your system. The surroundings would be anything in contact with that. The room, the container itself, anything that's in contact. One thing that we know now about heat is that it flows from where there's lots of heat, we call that the heat source, to where there's not a lot of heat, we call that the heat sink. Another way of looking at that is, is that we can look at heat flowing from high temperature to low temperature. That's called the temperature gradient, the degree to which the temperature is changing from one section to another, from one section of the system to another. In, in order for heat to flow, though, we, we generally like that what it's flowing from and what it's flowing to be in contact. Now, if you do have two areas in contact and they're at the same temperature, then there's not going to be any change of heat. We call that thermodynamic equilibrium, which means balance. It means there's no transfer of heat. Heat won't, won't flow between two things at the same temperature because there's no need to. Heat always flows from the source to the sink. It always flow, flows from where there's lots of heat to where there's little. The two general ways that heat can move, the most common way and the way that we'll be dealing with is something called conduction. So heat flows between objects that are in contact. Heat does not flow through a vacuum very well in terms of heat and kinetic energy. Now you can get heat to move to a, through a vacuum if you have radiant heat. So if heat flows by radiation, it travels in, a, in the electromagnetic spectrum. It travels in the infrared area of the spectrum. And that's one of the ways that we get heat from the sun, is through radiant energy, because we're not in contact with the sun. That would be uncomfortable. So the heat on this planet, a lot of it comes from radiant energy. But we're going to be interested in conductive heat. In other words, we want to have contact between the two things uh, that the heat is transferring between. And if there's no contact between them, then it's not going to transfer very well. Certainly not through a vacuum, but even through air. Heat doesn't travel through air very well, which is what uh, helps us to design things like insulators, and we'll get to that later. We have two terms that we want to talk about. The first is exothermic. And exo means outside. So exothermic means heat is coming out of your system. In other words, energy is produced in a particular reaction. If a reaction produces heat, if we're looking and observing the reaction, that's our system, and then heat is coming out of that reaction, that's exothermic. It flows out of a system, exo, out. If you touch the container and it feels hot to the touch, that means that there's heat coming out of that container into your hand. So heat is coming out of the system, that's exothermic. The opposite of exothermic is endothermic. Endo means inside or in. And so if energy is consumed by the reaction, then energy has to go into the system. And that's endothermic, inside. And if you were to touch a container containing an endothermic reaction, it would feel cold because the heat is leaving your hand and going into it. So we want to become very familiar with the terms endo and exothermic. We use them to describe reactions and processes all the time. What's important, again, is that you know what your system is, because you can't decide if something is exothermic or endothermic unless you know what the system is, so you can tell whether heat is coming out or going in. For example, we have a reaction between methane and oxygen. And when I combine methane and oxygen, when I react them together, it releases a tremendous amount of heat. Well, that's how we heat with gas, natural gas. That's how we heat with a Bunsen burner. We're burning methane, and that reaction produces a great deal of heat. And so energy is released to the surroundings. It's coming out of the reaction. So we describe that reaction as being exothermic. Something like com combination of nitrogen and oxygen to make NO, nitrogen monoxide, that doesn't happen by itself. That doesn't happen unless you put in a tremendous amount of heat. You have to add lots and lots of energy to get nitrogen and oxygen to combine to form nitrogen monoxide. So that's an endothermic process. The overall energy of a process is a, a difference. It comes from the difference between the energy of the reactants, the starting materials, the starting conditions, and the energy of the products where you end up. And so ideally, if you start with a lot of energy and you end up with a very little bit of energy, that has to be exothermic. And if you start with your reactants or your starting material is low in energy, potential energy, 
and your products are very high in potential energy, well, then you have to put energy in. That's endothermic. Remember, you can't destroy or create energy. So that means that whatever energy you're producing or absorbing in the reaction has to equal the amount of energy that was either absorbed or produced by the surroundings. So the total amount of energy out of your system has to be the total amount of energy that the surroundings takes away and vice versa because you can't just destroy energy. Energy has to go somewhere. Usually in terms of chemical reactions, the weaker the bond in a chemical, the more potential energy it has because if, they've, if it's got lots of weak bonds, every time you break bonds you release the energy. That's an exothermic process. And so if you have something that has lots of potential energy, its bonds are going to be pretty weak because it, you can release that energy. You can break those bonds and release that energy and, and it'll come down in, in potential energy. So in, in terms of thermodynamics, we want to understand that thermodynamics is the study of energy and its transfers. And the first law of thermodynamics says that the energy of the universe is constant. That means you can't create it or destroy it. You can only change it from one form into another. Now there are a number of laws of thermodynamics, but this is the one that we're going to be spending our time on, the first law of thermodynamics. And it seems pretty simple to understand, and it is. Now the way we measure heat, heat is not temperature. Remember that. Temperature is kinetic energy. It's motion of particles. Heat is a different kind of energy, and so it needs a different kind of unit. The first unit you may be familiar with, you may have heard the word calorie, comes from the Latin word for heat, calor. And a calorie is just the amount of heat energy required to raise the temperature of a gram of water by a degree Celsius. So if you have one gram of water, that's one milliliter, and you want to change its temperature, you want to raise its temperature from whatever it's at up by one degree, you need to add one calorie of heat. It's not a very large amount of heat. We've heard the term calorie, or normally, or in common practice, when we refer to food. And that's because the word calorie has another meaning. Although it's not the same word calorie that we have here, it's actually something called a kilocalorie, kcal. Sometimes it's called a nutritional calorie or just calorie, but when you write the word calorie and you're referring to food, you write it with a capital C. To avoid confusion, because when I say the word calorie, you don't know if I'm saying it with a capital C or a lowercase c. To avoid the confusion, we're going to just simply refer to nutritional or food calories as kilocalories. And a kilocalorie is a thousand calories. So when you eat something that contains a hundred calories, what you're really eating is enough energy to provide a hundred thousand calories. So there's a difference between those two. Food calories, when you read a food label, you're measuring it in thousands of calories. Now the other unit of heat, which is the SI standard unit of heat, is called the joule. The joule comes from physics. It's a measurement of energy and it's related to um, force, newtons. And essentially a, a joule is the amount of energy that you would need to apply to, uh, to apply a force of one newton over, over a meter of distance. So if you were to raise a, an apple by applying a force of a newton over, over one meter, that would be one joule. Um, the conversion is there, but we don't ever really use the conversion in chemistry because we're just measuring heat and we just use the word joule as the unit. But what's important about joules is to know how they relate to calories. Uh, a calorie is about four joules, and so a joule is an even smaller measurement of heat than a calorie is, but it's the SI standard unit of heat, and so we use it more commonly than we use calories. We'll use the, the unit of calorie when we're doing anything with food primarily, but uh, when we're just talking about heat transfer in general, we'll be using joules. Uh, if you have a large number of joules, of course, you can use any of the metric prefixes. You can use kilojoules. Kilojoules would be a thousand joules, and that's a more common uh, unit, especially when you start dealing with large amounts of heat. So this is the basics of the nature of energy, the nature of heat energy. Uh, what we now are going to do is to use this information to do some observations and some calculations about systems. And that will come in the form of something called calorimetry. We do have a couple of things that we have to do before then, but for now, uh, stop the video, rewind it, rewatch it if you need to, but get these terms sort of squared away in your head so that you understand how to converse about heat.